Welcome to the Gold Newsletter Podcast, your bank of knowledge of investment, economics, and geopolitics. Go to goldnewsletter.com for our publications and archives. This is the Gold Newsletter Podcast. Fergus Hodgson, your host, with Brian London. And our guest this week is George Gammon. I'm in the Denver airport and committed to doing the show this week. Uh, George is a real estate investor, entrepreneur, and economics addict, and he has a, an extremely popular YouTube channel. George, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to get going and hopefully deliver some value to your audience. Right. I must admit, I, I really appreciate your willingness to basically live outside of the beaten path. And as you said, you live almost a nomadic lifestyle now or you're exploring. I've, I've always enjoyed that myself and want to keep doing that. Now, you made the switch a few years ago to being a full-time investor as opposed to running, it, running a regular business. And you decided to start a YouTube channel. What were the myths you were trying to address with your YouTube channel, with your own show? Well, I don't know that if I, I was specifically addressing myths. I, I was just trying to get my thoughts out of my head and onto a whiteboard. And so I, I like if I got, uh, if something pissed me off for lack of a better word, <laughs> I would see it in the media or I'd see something going on with the housing market or quantitative easing. And I'd just be like, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. I got to do a whiteboard video on this. So it was more that kind of uh, motivation. But originally I had a TV show in Medellin, Colombia. It was based on real estate investing. It was just like one of these HGTV shows. And this was early 2019. And I produced the show myself. I pitched it to the local station. And uh, that's kind of an, an entrepreneurial story for those Is this who are in interested. Spanish? They yes. had a show in English? That was my point. I didn't speak Spanish. And I pitched them on not only me producing the show, but me being in the show as someone that does not speak Spanish in Medellin, Colombia. And uh, I tell that story because most people would have never, you know, they would have created all these roadblocks that just don't exist. That's what I call them. And I, you know, you just go in there and you shoot first and ask questions later. And the next thing you know, you got a TV show on Sunday nights at eight o'clock and um, you just have to make it happen. So anyway, uh, we did a season of that and it was really popular and everyone loved it. But uh, after 13 episodes, we we're going to take a break between season two. And I had all these great editors and all these people working for me on the TV show. And I wanted to keep them working. So that's why I started the YouTube channel. And originally, it was kind of about real estate because I didn't think anyone in their right mind would watch a, a video on macroeconomics, although that's what I really enjoyed talking about. I've, I'd been in real estate for a long time, and I knew it extremely well. But whenever I'm at the dinner table or uh, just listening to podcasts or audiobooks, it's always, always, always macroeconomics. So I snuck in a couple macro videos into the channel. And oddly enough, uh, no one really watched the real estate videos, but everyone watched the videos on macro. So it was a good fit. It worked well. And uh, here we are, probably a year and a half later. And we've got uh, almost 220,000 subscribers and 1.5 million views a month. Yeah, and one of the things you do so well is educate and, and you bring the points home so powerfully and the whiteboard effect does such a great job. Your recent video in MMT was just spectacular, I thought, uh, and really illustrated what's going on right now. My own view in MMT is that it's been the, kind of the de facto uh, method of operation for so long and they're just kind of wrapping it up uh, in you know, in, in admitting that that why why uh, have any more pretense? This is the way it is, and also that's not a problem. The issue with me is that they say the only problem will be if inflation, and uh, that you can tamp that down by raising taxes, removing liquidity from the system, et cetera. But they don't actually say what that is. I mean, when inflation gets to be that kind of a problem, it gets out of control. You basically you have an economic crisis. Uh, if you, on top of that, increase taxes, then you, you know, you further uh, destroy the econ economy, for, send it deeper, deeper into recession and or depression. 
So they, they, they're basically saying everything's fine until you reach the economic apocalypse. And, um, and they don't go any further than that, really. Um, I think now that's going to gain even more popularity, more currency, more credibility with the new Biden administration uh, coming in. Now there'll be a deadlock government, but there will still be a bias, at least through regulation, through Treasury and the Fed, more so toward MMT. Do you, do you agree with that, I guess? And what do you think the repercussions of that may be? I do. That's probably my strongest conviction idea is that we will have MMT. It's just, a, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. I think it's politically, it's too popular. And everyone thinks, everyone meaning the politicians and society at large, they think that uh, inflation is dead. They think we'll never have it again. And they use 2008 to 2020 as an example of that. They say, look, the Fed took their balance sheet from 800 million, so let's call it 7 trillion, and we didn't have hyperinflation like all you stupid Austrians thought. So instead of creating that in with bank reserves at the Fed, where the only people that benefit are you know, the capacity of the bank's balance sheets and hedge funds, financial institutions, or people that are in the stock market, well, let's just go ahead and do call it QE for the people, where that goes out into the real economy through stimulus or through uh, you know, checks, uh, UBI, whatever you want to call it. And we could just print up another $7 trillion, give it to the average Joe and Jane. And because it didn't happen between 2008 and 2020, meaning hyperinflation, uh, it won't happen and we never have to worry about it. I mean, you, it's, it, and it's in the pop culture right now. I don't know if you guys are on Twitter, but when Kelton's book came out the other day, even Ice T, the rapper, was talking about it, saying that, well, now money does grow on trees. And once you get the, the, the rappers and the musicians and the athletes and the actors on board with MMT, it's just, I mean, it's a foregone conclusion. And what's, what's odd about MMT and the people who are proponents is they treat it as though it's this revolutionary idea that the government can actually print money. And I, I'm always baffled by that because that's, that's who, I mean, you take any uh, third or fourth grader and ask them if the government can print money and they'll say, yes, this is not a revolutionary idea. It's just for some reason um, they think it's novel or they're trying to spin it to have some sort of, uh, you know, clout, political clout. And if you listen to the macro voices interview with Kelton and my good friend, Eric Townsend, yeah, I think you can tell by her trying to wiggle her way out of every single question that Eric asks her that she's kind of uh, angling for some sort of political position or something at the Fed or the Treasury. Uh, who knows? But the bottom line, to your point, is it's definitely coming. And people need to understand the big difference between doing quantitative easing the way we've done it since 2008 and doing quantitative easing where the Fed is just monetizing the deficit spending of the government and the government is spending it directly into the economy. People don't understand the difference and they really need to. I'm, I'm happy to go into it if you want me to. Actually, I, I, let's go through that, George, because as, as Brian was saying, many of, to me, there's already been um, mon modern monetary theory or, or basically printing of the deficit for years. So what is this, this distinction that, coming ahead? Yeah, so what happens when the Fed does QE, quantitative easing, or what has happened in the past? And I'd also like to point out that Japan and UK did a little different too, along with the European Union. But let's talk about the, the United States. When they're doing QE, they're buying, let's say, treasuries or mortgage-backed securities from banks. It's just an asset swap. So they're trading bank reserves for treasuries or mortgage-backed securities. And what that does effectively is it increases the balance sheet capacity of the commercial banking system. So that just means in layman terms, it, it allows the banks to do more loans, to create more, uh, more debt in the system. And if you look at the way money is created uh, when we're not monetizing the debt, that's the main way that currency units uh, are created in the real economy is by a bank creating a loan. And so when that loan is paid off, money is destroyed 
And when the loan is created, money is created as well. And if you look at, you know, quote unquote, I don't like to call it money, but we'll call it currency, electronic currency units. It's really just a liability of the commercial banking system. There's really nothing there. People look at their bank statement and think that that's actual money. It's, it's not. It's just an IOU from the commercial bank. <laughs> so, so anyway, my point is that it just gives the commercial banking system more balance sheet capacity to create more loans. But you, so you've got the supply side there, but people forget about the demand side first and foremost, meaning that they assume that, well, if we, if we take away the reserve requirements for the banks and we give them all these bank reserves, so now they can create as many loans as they want to, then there's all these people out there, they're gonna wanna actually take out debt. That's not true. Uh, you can only take out so much debt that your income will allow. And I understand that if interest rates go down and down and down, it makes debt easier to service. But at some point, you still have to have the income. And especially when you have something like the, the COVID or whatever, you know, a lot of fewer people are taking out loans. There's a lot less demand. And so regardless of how much capacity the balance sheets uh, of the banking system or the, how much capacity the banks have to lend, there has to be demand also the banks still are uh, constrained by having to create loans where they think they'll actually get paid back. And so if they look out into the real economy and they're like, we're not going to lend out there. And additionally, there's no demand. Then all of those bank reserves and all that quantitative easing, it doesn't really, it doesn't do anything. It just creates a psychological component that drives the stock market higher and a few other things with hedge funds and financial institutions. But it really stays in the real or in the financial economy and it doesn't get out. It doesn't create more bank deposits or bank liabilities. And when you're thinking about inflation or deflation, you've got to think, okay, how many currency units are in the real economy chasing goods and services? So what you should be hyper focused on are, is, is the deposits that are in the commercial banking system. Well, you could take bank reserves up to a quadrillion dollars. And if the banks don't do anything, then it all it does is just increase the size of the Fed's balance sheet. So let's move on to MMT. What they're saying is now the government needs to start spending it directly into the economy through let's call it UBI or, or stimulus. And that that's different because now what you're doing is you're increasing the size of the Fed's balance sheet because it's basically a shell game with the primary dealer banks. Well, they'll buy the treasuries at auction and then they'll just flip them to the Fed and the Fed will give them new bank reserves for those treasuries that they just bought, most likely with bank reserves at auction. So the Fed's balance sheet is increasing, but then the government spends the money into the real economy, creating more bank deposits. So now you have a system that's creating more currency units, chasing the same amount of goods or services. And now that we have COVID, you, you could argue that we have more currency units chasing fewer goods and services. And then you have this narrative that we need to bring all of our production back into the United States. That will reduce supply even further. And if we go into a second, third wave, whatever you want to call it, these lockdowns across the world, you're going to continually reduce supply chains. So we've seen things like lumber go up uh, four times. We've seen food prices skyrocket. And it's a result of these supply chains being destroyed. Well, if you're doing that while at the same time creating more bank deposits, you're most likely going to have a stagflationary environment. The Gold Newsletter Podcast is proudly sponsored by the Discovery Group of Exploration and Development Companies. To learn more about our exceptional track record and exciting future, visit discoverygroup.ca. Hi, this is Brian London back again this week for our weekly CEO interview in which we interview the CEO of one of the companies in the discovery group of companies, which of course is the sponsor of the, the uh, Gold Newsletter podcast. This week, we welcome back Fred Bell, the CEO of Elemental Royalties. Now, this is uh, a company that may not be unique, but it may be unique, but certainly special in the fact that it, it came to market recently with actually cash producing royalties in primarily the gold space. And that's kind of its niche. What we'd like to cover 
uh, today, Fred, is, is this really, you know, I hate to use a trite phrase, but window of opportunity, a real market anomaly in that you just announced a transformational acquisition, a deal with South 32 for royalties, a, a portfolio of royalties that doubles your asset size, will double your cash flow within really just a few months, fairly early in, into next year. Uh, and the share price right now is back to where it was before the uh, the announcement. So, so what's up? What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. Um, I think uh, look, we announced on on the Monday uh, last week, Monday the twenty third of, of um, November, and I think it was um, it was a, a pretty down day for the whole market there. Not um, a good day for gold. No, not a good day for gold. Yeah. So, uh, I think also as well, it's. Uh, um, we had a, a financing concurrently with the announcement of the transaction, and so I think there's a um, there's a limitation on sort of marketing um, that can be done by by those um, by some of the brokers in the, in that. Yeah. So I think that as soon as that closes, um, and as soon as um, we're able to, uh, I suppose other people are able to amplify the message. I think it will get out there. But it is a transformational acquisition for us. Um, you know, on every metric, as you said, it's. It's uh, from, from mid-2022, um, we'll have a 2% royalty on Australia's newest gold mine. Um, it's entering production in, in Q2 next year. And then I think that we have organic growth in the portfolio from 2021, 2022, and 2023. So really, from next year, mid-next year onwards, we have um, you know, revenue that, that grows without us doing anything else. And that was already the case before we listed. It's even more so the case now. And so you're looking at us today on a valuation um, that is, you know, it's, it's sort of, um, I don't think it, it even reflects the assets that we have, let alone today, let alone what will be in the next six months, nine months, a year. Yeah, you were, you were undervalued. Or there was a very strong argument <clears throat> to make it you were undervalued before you made that announcement. And, and so this confluence of factors, we had gold, crate, gold price cratering on the day that you made the announcement. You know, bad luck there, but also two of the the uh, institutions that cover you now, maybe the only two that cover you now, were in the the syndicate for the financing that you are announced to basically fund that South Thirty Two deal, and those two basically all the institutional coverage they can't even talk to their clients about this big transformational deal. So into the gap are the retail investors who aren't so constrained, who we're talking to now, who can take advantage of this anomalous situation uh, and, uh, and invest in a company that had a rapid growth curve before all of a sudden it doubled everything. Yeah, and I think look, Elemental has always been set up to provide um, safer returns yeah. you know, for a diversified portfolio of gold projects than a mining company, a development company. And I think we're doing that at the same time that we've been able to double the revenue year on year, um, you know, scaling up the business model. And yep. this transaction um, from when we listed in mid 2020, um, it, it doubles the company across most of the metrics. It also weights the portfolio towards Australia, which is, I think, probably one of the things people might have previously said about us. So I think then you're looking at a at a royalty company that will go from roughly 5 million US dollars of revenue in 2020 up to about 8 million in 2021. And then when we have a full year's revenue, about 12 million in 2022. And then again in 2023, it's growing. And that's without us spending any more money, without us doing anything on, on, on you know, new investments or other assets. And so I think yeah, that- and you're, you're not gonna be sitting on your hands during all that time. You're gonna be out there making more deals, right? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, look, we've been listed, uh, we started this year with two full-time employees and yeah. with this deal, um, you know, we've now got, we've now got four, but, um, and a really good board, but I think we've, we've done $67 million of acquisitions this year so far, as well as a listing, as well as debt facilities, as well as starting to trade on the OTC in the US, um, as well as all the marketing that a new company does with analysts, investment banks and brokers. So, Certainly, it hasn't been um, the case that you know we have rested on on sort of what we already have, and it's never been the case. Elemental was a startup royalty company, so we've we've done the hardest part in many ways first, 
good quality producing gold assets from day one that give you revenue, diversified, lower risk, and I think offer that ability to, to go and go and go. And that's what you want to see with a royalty model. Optionality. Future yeah. discovery at all these mines, we get at no cost. And so every asset we're buying now, we're looking at it and going, is it actually going to be a 10-year mine life? Or does it have the potential to be a 20-year mine life? And if we can buy five of those, then you know we put ourselves in a really good position where every year we're getting more ounces added than we're actually um, being mined on our on our projects. Yeah, and you know one of the well, people always talk about the the advantages of a royalty company: lower risk and operational costs or hassles. Uh, the institutions love them. Uh, investors love them. They give them a higher valuation. Um, but one of the things that I think investors kind of gloss over or miss is that it, in the lifespan, in the growth curve of a royalty company, all of a sudden when they hit a critical mass, then a lot of good things happen. You get more revenue. You can use your share your shares as currency. In fact, you did that to a large extent with the South 32 deal in that they recognized they'd rather have your stock at this stage than, than uh, a portion of the cash necessary to buy the royalties. Um, so investors at these levels are really investing alongside some very smart people. But once you get to that critical mass, then all of a sudden uh, institutions start applying different uh, metrics to your projections, different uh, um, uh, projections to, on, on earnings and multiples, and, uh, and you get more attention. Now, this South 32 deal is hard to believe, uh, but that's your first real acquisition as a public company, isn't it? Yeah, and I think it's, 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 it's a case that when we were private in the lead up to this, yeah. I think what we had done really well is we had done a series of very good value accretive transactions, but without necessarily being huge by themselves. And so when we listed, I think the feedback we got was you've got some really good assets and you've done very well at adding shareholder value, but can you get scale? Yeah. Can you get increased diversification? Um, can you potentially even get weighting towards tier one jurisdiction? And if you look at all three of those, this acquisition ticks that box as well as I think being a really good endorsement from a major $8 billion mining company in, in South 32 coming on as our largest shareholder. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess uh, it would uh, be too much to ask that your succeeding acquisitions also double and double your, uh, your asset base and cash flow, but you are setting a high bar for yourself with this. It's just indicative, I think, of where we are with the elemental royalty story. Um, early on in the growth curve, Yet the valuation, the market valuation, uh, does not reflect your recent acquisitions, and not it doesn't reflect where you are now, where you've just gotten to, and where you're about to go. So, very exciting days ahead, Fred. We really appreciate the opportunity to catch up with you today uh, at this juncture in the company. It, it, I know you'd you'd like your share price to reflect your value uh, much more closely and be much higher. But for the investors looking at this right now, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. And uh, I don't think, I don't see how it can last long considering you're actually gonna be making cash from gold production and rapidly increasing that income in the months just ahead. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Brian, much appreciate it. You, uh, George, that that brings up a good point. And one of the issues that we were addressing in this year's New Orleans Investment Conference was the fact that M2 uh, velocity, money velocity has absolutely collapsed. And it's a trend that goes back to say 2000, where you have declining uh, velocity, how much currency, how much money uh, turns over in the economy. Um, and you had that trend beginning in 2000, it took a steeper dive post 2008. And then a, a just the bottom fell out post COVID. Um, is that a sign? I mean, I can see 2008. You have you have a very tepid economic recovery. Uh, post COVID, you have a complete economic shutdown or a virtually complete economic shutdown. 
But what's when you go back to 2000 and see it start declining, what is that an indication of? Is, is it a slowing down in the economy yeah. uh, generally? And, and why would that have started around 2000? Well, because the, well, there's a lot of different reasons. I don't know how far in the weeds you want to get because we could talk about the Euro dollar system. And I think that's kind of at the core of my good buddy, Jeff Snyder and I have had a lot of conversations about that. But if you just think about what, uh, or how they measure velocity or how they get the, the, the number, it's simply nominal GDP divided by the money supply. That's how you get velocity. So if money supply is going up faster than GDP, then velocity is going to go down. So it's really a a matter of how effective the economy is utilizing the increase in money supply. And if they're using it um, in a way that's that's less and less efficient, then you're going to have velocity go down. But you've got to, but then you have to ask the question, can they measure money? They mean the Fed, because you look at a Fred chart and you see the velocity or M2, but can they really measure M2? And if they can't measure M2, then there's no way to get um, an accurate assessment of velocity. And I'm not saying that velocity hasn't gone down, but people, I I think they just take it at face value and they don't really think through, well, what if they can't measure M2? And what if M2 is wrong? And then what if velocity is wrong? And then kind of working backwards from there. So it has declined, but we probably don't have an accurate picture of it. And it's and it's probably a combination longer term of increase money supply increasing more quickly than demand or use of the money. And then more recently, 2008 and post COVID, uh, basically economic slowdowns that haven't really generated much turnover in the currency that is being created. But that's interesting too, because we're getting an awful lot of currency being created right now. Well, that goes back to what we were saying about M, uh, about. Um... MMT and the difference between quantitative easing, what we've done and the quantitative easing where, if you want to call it that, where the Fed is just monetizing the debt of the government, the government's spending it into existence. So just look at a chart of M2 money supply. I mean, it just gradually goes up as we're doing QE. And then just in the last couple of months, I mean, it's gone completely parabolic. And the reason it's gone parabolic is because the Fed is now buying almost 100% of the treasuries that are being issued at auction. So if the Fed's buying all these treasuries, they're directly monetizing the debt. So what happens when the government normally spends money, they're taking money out of the economy, then spending it back in. So let's just think about taxes, right? They're taking taxes from all of us, and that's taking the deposits in the commercial banking system. That's reducing those deposits. And then when they spend the money back, then it's increasing the deposits in the same amount, right? But if, if the, so M2 is a net wash, but if the government is creating these uh, treasuries and the Fed is just buying them with what I call funny money, these bank reserves, and then they're spending them, then that's increasing M2 on net balance. And so that's why you see that big spike in M2, in my opinion over the last few months, because you look at the amount of treasuries that are being purchased by the Fed as far as a percentage, and it's not 100%, but it's, it's, it's darn near. Yeah, and money spent by the government in whatever its form is still money being spent. And given the current uh, uh, deficit, um, the, the deficit and deficit spending, money spent by the government is basically an increase in debt. Um, and also there's off budget items, et cetera, et cetera. But that, how does all this relate to the debt? Now, when we had Alan Greenspan at the conference, I forget how many years ago, probably five or six years ago, um, his basic explanation for why he kind of got subsumed by the system, became part of the system was that his job was to, uh, was to act, you know, the government spending and he had to finance that debt, the government spending. And if he didn't, then there would be somebody else in his job the next week who would actually do it. So he might as well do it and try and adjust the system on the inside, as it were, which he never really did, of course. But that was his rationale that the government is spending money. It's the Fed's job to finance that debt. Um, 
but still the debt is there. And at one of the, the repercussions of this low interest rate policy is that it encourages further debt creation, both on the sovereign level and corporate and individual level. And now we've gotten to the point where that's kind of a, an anchor on the economy, an anchor on everything, and forces, in my view, forces low interest rates, really negative on a real basis, interest rates forevermore because we can't service that debt. What are your views on, on that and the, the problem that debt creates and what it, what it means for, the, uh, for interest rates going forward? Well, let me write that down here. Let's all circle back. So first, I think when you look at the debt, most people don't look at debt correctly, or they don't look at the, the negative impact of debt correctly. So what I mean by that is they just look at how much debt there's out there, let's say 27 trillion on the, the, the government's balance sheet, and they'll say, oh my gosh, how are we ever going to pay that off? Or if interest rates spike, you know, then that's going to make force them to spend more money and uh, by just the service of debt they're going to have to monetize it even more and the release valve is going to be the dollar there are all these problems that we're going to have by increasing the debt and i i don't think i think that's a problem for sure but i don't think that's the biggest problem and i think if we look at japan as an example that really illustrates my point so let, let's think about this the boj right now the bank of japan owns about 60 percent of the government debt so we we talk about a, a debt jubilee and it's an interesting concept right if, if the boj owns 60 percent of the debt of the government and it those are the only two balance sheets involved why can't you just hit the delete button right would, would anyone know the next morning, or I mean, they might not even announce it. Like, like what difference would that make? It wouldn't make any difference. It's only just an electronic number on one balance sheet and electronic number on the other. You know, so you reduce the Japanese debt from call it 250% of GDP down to whatever, 100, 120%. And then you're, you're off to the races again, problem solved, right? And if, and there's a lot of really smart people that are trying to think through the negative ramifications of that but it, there could be none, but that's not the point. See, the people are getting fixated on, well, would the yen blow up? Would interest rates spike? Well, I mean, there's gotta be some sort of negative consequence or else money does grow on trees. You know, we, where there's free money, why not just do this over and over and over again? But what they're not realizing is the negative impact isn't what happens in the future. The negative impact is what has happened in the past. See, most people don't understand that when the government spends money, it's distorting the economy. It's a misallocation of resources most of the time. And you can argue about uh, infrastructure spending, but that'll only get you so far, especially nowadays. If you look at the government's uh, P&L, you know, most of what they spend is just a total misallocation of resources. And again, you can see. Well, the, yeah, these these days, the, the been, federal government in the United States, at least, is mainly devoted to wealth redistribution, right? Just enormous transfer payments. Yeah, and you go back to Japan and look at what they've spent the money on. They've spent the money on propping up these zombie corporations and zombie banks, and they're not allowing this the, the Jupiter's creative destruction, right? And so you look at what percentage of, the, uh, of GDP the government's spending is, and if it's, you know, like right now in the United States, it's almost 57%. So how, how, how agile is that economy? It's, it's, it's not gonna be very strong because you take it to an extreme and a hundred percent, well, now we're at straight communism and we know what happens there, right? So my point going back to Japan is that all the damage has already been done through the government taking the debt from call it 50% of GDP all the way up to 250%. The, the, the economy is effectively destroyed it's, it's done. So, so you know, it's, it's not about the debt jubilee, what will happen. It's more so about the, the negative ramifications of the government spending in the first place. And then taking this back to what it means for Americans is, is we're going down that exact same path. So the more the government spends, the more it'll distort the economy. And the government spending as a percentage of GDP is skyrocketing. 
you know, just before um, COVID, excuse me, it's right around 40, 40%. But you take that all the way back to before the Fed was created and government spending was only about 3% of GDP. So that means that the private sector accounted for 97% of GDP. Well, what, what economy do you think is more dynamic? What economy do you think is producing a better standard of living for not just the upper class, but the poor and middle class? Uh, an economy where 97% of the output is from the private sector or an economy where only caught 40% is from the private sector. You see, yeah, so George, that's why we have yeah, economic you, you're, output you're, continue to decline in the, in the private sector because of COVID and that gap being filled by called MMT and all these stimulus checks, in, in other words, more government spending. You know, what? at what point do we cross over to an economy where there is just absolutely, we're, we're past the point of no return. I mean, is that at, at 70%? Is that at 80%? At 90% of the economy is government spending? At what point do you do you just put your flag in the ground and say, okay, we're officially communist Russia. We're officially a socialist country. What percentage of GDP is required from government spending to where you make that announcement? And, and we're getting there a, a lot, I mean, we're getting there extremely quick, far faster than I ever thought we would when I started the YouTube channel back in 2019. And what we're, we're seeing right now with the political narrative, it, we're just going to get there that we're, we're on the, the fast train. And um, I don't see a, a way out, quite frankly. Yeah. So basically, you're saying that we should not be so focused on inflation, but rather the restructuring of the economy. Well, you, you have to restructure the economy. And unfortunately, to, to restructure the economy, you have to restructure the monetary system because that's what's really broken. It goes back to, to the euro dollar system and how hard it is to, to you know, figure out what the, the M2 money supply is. And, and the euro dollar system broke back in 2008 when we had the GFC, and it's never been fixed. And, the, 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 and you can see this when you look at the... the Look at whatever we want. Look at the excess reserves in the banking system or look at the Fed's balance sheet. You know, how on earth could we run an economy where the, um, the, the, the TGA or the excess reserves in the system are only at, uh, call it $8 billion. And now they've got to be at 3.5 trillion. Or how can we run an economy where the Fed's balance sheet is only at, call it 800 million. And now it has to be over 7 trillion just in order for it to continue to function. You know, we, the only way that you can do that is if the free market is creating the liquidity that we need the Fed to create now. You see, we, that, that's the big problem here. And, if you, and you can think of it in really easy terms if you try to just go through a thought experiment and ask yourself, well, what would happen if the Fed took their balance sheet right now from seven trillion down to one trillion? What would happen or what would happen if you took the, the, the reserves in the banking system from whatever it is now called 3.5 trillion down to 8 billion? The whole, the whole system would collapse. It would completely collapse in on itself. The house of cards comes crumbling down. And that's because we, the, the, the free market in the monetary system in creating dollars necessary for the world economy completely broke in 2008 and it's never been fixed and everything that we've done everything the central planners have done i should say is just a patch to that and we're never going to see real economic growth again until we fix that monetary system and you and there's a good argument for saying that we can't fix that monetary system until the whole thing collapses and we have to build it from scratch yeah and i think that's what i'm getting from this is uh is the big picture, the big issue is the trend. And the trend has gotten progressively worse and worse, and now it's accelerating. Um, and it's just going to get to the point where something loses credibility, whether it's the dollar, the financial system, all encompassed, whether all of that loses credibility. And we're going to have to get to some point where we do have a monetary reset. I agree that it's not going to come until every everything loses credibility, unless, unless there's some uh, blow up of the financial system where there absolutely has to be some, some type of a, uh, a major reset, 
Now, at that point, is that the point where we go completely socialist and say, well, the government's just totally in control. Let's just admit it and let's just go forward along those lines. Or is there some kind of a monetary reset where we try to restore credibility to the currency, to the dollar, by attaching it to gold uh, in some form or another, or maybe just a revaluation, devaluation? Oh, I, I think, unfortunately, in 2020, you, you've got to start by asking yourself the social unrest. Wh where, right. What's that going to look like? And uh, right now we have an economy that's built on asset prices, debt and confidence and, and ever more increasingly asset prices. So you think about what's the way to prop that up? Well, don't you know, do that through quantitative easing, let's say. But the more quantitative easing you do, sure, that props up asset prices, but it increases the wealth gap. And the higher the wealth gap goes, the more social unrest you have. Yeah. So just by the, the Fed propping up the economy, we're going to get more and more social unrest. And so I think you have to use game theory. Well, you've got to use that to look at social unrest and what you think it might look like in 2021, 2022, based on the Fed's actions, understanding that they have painted themselves into a corner where they have to prop up the stock market. They have to prop up asset prices. And they've shown, they've shown their hand. Look at what they're willing to do. They're willing to buy junk debt, for heaven's sakes. They're, they're willing to do all these things that are far outside of the Federal Reserve Act. They'll go to any extreme measure necessary to attempt to prop up asset prices. And in doing so, they exacerbate the, 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 the social unrest that we have. So, you, you, so you've got to try to figure out, okay, where is that going? And if we do get MMT, does that reduce the amount of social unrest? But unfortunately, if you go that route, then you're going to be increasing the amount of inflation. You see, there's no easy way out of this. Either you get the social unrest or you get the inflation. And at some point, the release valve, in my opinion, is, is going to be the United States dollar. That's not to say that it's a direct path down. I'm really good buddies with, uh, with Brent Johnson and, and Steve Van Meter and, and Snyder and these guys that, that see the dollar going up and, and having this crushing effect on the global economy because there's so much dollar denominated debt outside the United States. And the, the DXY potentially go up to 120, 130 to the point where we need a Plaza Accord 2.0. They got to come in and artificially lower the dollar. But at some point, regardless of whether we have a big spike and then come back down, the, the, this, this um, I'll call it a money experiment, this monetization of the debt has to continue. Look at this. That between 1776 and 1996, the United States government accumulated about $5 trillion in debt. Our deficit just this year will be almost $5 trillion. So just this year, the United States has accumulated the same amount that it did in the first 220 years of its existence. <laughs> how, does, how does that end well? And, and how does that not end in a collapse of the dollar? The only way that, that you can kind of connect those dots is if you print more and more and more money, or the only way to prop that up is if you just do more and more and to the point where it becomes exponential. And when the money printing becomes exponential, right, then the confidence in the dollar goes down at the same speed, right? And if you think about what the dollar is or what any fiat currency is, all it is, I mean, what gives the dollar value? I mean, if, if people actually thought about that for five minutes, the only thing that gives the dollar value is a belief that it has value. Yeah. That's it. That's it. And if that belief is gone, then the value is gone. And that's what you see in hyperinflation type of scenarios, whether it's Weimar, whether it's Venezuela, Zimbabwe, you name it. That's what happens. A, a belief in the value of the currency evaporates and it evaporates very quickly. And my point is, is the more you get to this exponential growth curve, of the, of the money printing or creating more currency units, chasing the same amount of goods and services, the closer you get to the evaporation of the, the, the belief in the society at large that the currency has value. And, and that's where I think 
the the end game takes you. You know, I think a good example of that, I know, Fergus, we're getting longer in time now, but it, it's a really good point about the belief in the value of the currency, the credibility of the currency can just go haywire at any point in time when it reaches critical mass or critical inflection point. In my presentations, I like to show a chart of the purchasing power of the dollar since 1965 when they took silver out of the coinage. And it, you know, it, and it has a very steep decline in the 70s and it kind of levels off, but it's always declining. It never has these brief periods where it gains purchasing power. It's a long-term destruction in the value of the purchasing power. And I plot that against the gold price and that in terms of dollars is a jaggedy chart going up um, with big spikes and declines and everything else, but the general uptrend is up. And what that shows, the gold price shows, is not a relation or a direct correlation to the de destruction or the drop in the purchasing power of the dollar. It's an EKG of the public's confidence in the dollar. And during those periods when confidence wanes and it loses uh, that credibility, that faith in the populace, then the gold price goes up. Um, and so you have these lulls between them. And I just, I totally agree. I think the trend is reaching a culmination point now. Um, and at some point in the relatively near future, we're going to see um, that kind of reaction in the gold price, number one. But as evidence of the underlying loss of faith in the dollar in the whole financial system. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's why people have to own gold. I always suggest maybe 10% or so. And it's not to get rich. It's just to stay rich. I think that the, the people who try to own gold to get rich, it might it might pan out, it might not. I mean, you got to look at uh, taxes and there's a lot that goes into it. But the bottom line is, is if you want the, in my opinion, the safest type of portfolio moving into the future, you got to you got to have some gold. <laughs> I think you're just crazy not to. Yeah, George, I wanted to just comment briefly on your notion about the declining confidence in the US dollar. and. We discuss this often, and one of the challenges has just been that there's no easy alternative, aside from gold, or no other currency that people would naturally gravitate to. That's probably maybe what's allowing the US dollar to continue in its position right now. But as Brian said, we've really raced through the time. George, we appreciate your, your time with us. Go to his own YouTube channel, George Gammon, and we'll have the, all the details at goldnewsletter.com forward slash podcast. People, if you're watching this for the first time, please subscribe on SoundCloud, YouTube, whatever platform you're on. Otherwise, George, I look forward to next time. Thanks again. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks, George. Cheers. Really appreciate it.